Welcome back. Thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really do appreciate it. Uh, keep throwing comments in. I do appreciate those too. Uh, today, we're going to work on some fuel system because last time, as you remember, I got enough wiring done to test fire the engine. I also got tail lights and signals wired, things like that, and most of the dash. Um, we'll come back to more electrical at another time, but I like trying to fire an engine off as soon as I can, um, mostly because I, if there's a problem, it's easier to address that now instead of after the truck's all done. Um, so making sure it runs before you're finished is probably a good thing. Now, on this gas tank, I am going to have to cut the corner off of it. Uh, reason being is with this 14 bolt rear end in it, the drive shaft, and you know, I'm gonna run a monstrous drive shaft in this thing, so the drive shaft will hit the corner of the tank, and your drive shaft hitting your gas tank is probably not gonna be good in, well, any situation, so we're not gonna <laughs> go there. Um, if you remember me cutting gas tanks up or doing fuel work on gas tanks before, when you're doing this, please do it safely. Don't necessarily do what I do. I'm doing things my way. Um, if you're going to cut up gas tanks, do them your way. Uh, my way is, as I feed carbon monoxide off of a running vehicle into the tank to eliminate oxygen. No oxygen, no fire, no blow up. Um, even if this tank's been sitting a long time now since I pulled it out last year. And in reality, by the time I'm done cutting it up and getting ready to weld it back together, I probably won't have to worry about a flash fire at that time. But that being said, if you're gonna mess with gas tanks, please do it in a safe manner. Um, no liability here, okay? Uh, once the fuel tank is back together in this uh, run fuel line should fire up just fine. It fired up uh, out of the truck we pulled it out of. So uh, let's get started. If I can just cut this corner off here, the tank should work just fine. I can still use the original tank. The tank's actually in pretty good shape. So first step, let's get some measurements down. And I use tape to make sure it's straight because I Once it's all cut out, uh, I set it on my table and milk crate and test fit it. Make sure my clearances are okay before I start welding plates in. Then I just use some uh, flat sheet 14 gauge metal and cut myself out a little plate. All nice cleaned up and uh, it should fit perfect. With the tank open, I can kind of see the baffles. I can also measure where I need to and uh, where I'm gonna put the uh, fuel pump. Intake fuel pump requires uh, drilling a large hole in the top of it, and I don't have a hole saw this size, so the saber saw is uh, next up for this event. Definitely want to make sure you get all the burrs off of this and before I weld the tank up, I can make sure all the metal that I have now introduced to the tank has been vacuumed or cleaned out. When I'm welding this plate on, I added this strip of metal, you can see the little nubs on it, 
And I did that for two reasons. One, it makes it a lot more rigid. Plus, it also gives the tank strap a cradle so that the tank strap can't flex off. Once I got everything welded, I set the tank flat like it would be in the vehicle, filled it with water, made sure I didn't have any leaks. Uh, once I made sure no leaks were around, uh, taped off the areas that I didn't want to paint, and uh, nice coat of primer, nice coat of the traditional black paint, painted all my uh, mounting straps while I was at it, and next, up to fuel pump. I used the mounting plate that came with the fuel pump as a guide uh, for drilling the holes in the tank. This fuel tank is really deep, so I had to make me a little extension piece to drop the pump to the bottom of the tank. Got the tray. Now I leave the bag, I just put a cut in it so I can slip it onto the pump, and then I leave it until I'm ready to install it, and then I'll pull the bag out. Got the fuel pump, pigtail provided. This is the return line. This is the pressure line. Positive, negative. Positive comes up to uh, a disconnect, so I can remove it if I ever need to service it. And then I'll put an end on that to screw it down. Got pressure return. I'll put some dash six fittings in there, and that's a vent if you need a vent. Uh, this is now the right height for my 715 tank. Just a reminder, submersible pumps, make sure you use submersible rated hose. Otherwise, it'll just deteriorate in the tank and you'll have a mess. The threaded ring underneath, this is what the screws actually mount to and pinch the gasket. Quick little side note, make sure you face the pump and the tray the correct direction that you want it. So you start two of the long screws, then you remove those two retaining screws that you use to hold the little uh, plate on the bottom of the tank up. Then you can finish putting the rest of the screws in torquing those down and again don't go overboard on torque it's a quart gasket it just has to squeeze her down enough to seal it up getting this fuel sending unit in i'm not real sure how accurate it'll be uh, i had to put the longest extension and then bend the arm so that it kind of went around other stuff and baffles and pain in the butt stuff there in the tank. Take your time fitting your fuel sending unit. I try to get them as accurate as I can, but I will always err on the side. I have gas when the gauge says empty. Um, and you wanna make sure you kinda of get this pointing in the right direction so it doesn't hang up and then mark it so you know that's the right direction. The mounting holes for the fuel pump have the correct bolt pattern, but they're not quite spaced exactly right. So I had to auger a couple of the holes out so that I could use the pre-threaded holes in the original tank. Final installation, and I think we are gonna be in business with this one. Building all my fuel lines, everything is gonna be dash six AN fittings. I generally start running the lines from the engine back, and I put them around the bell housing. Uh, I kind of run them freehand, and then I add tabs where I know the lines are gonna be clamped and held in place. 
Uh, there's places behind the tank I have to weld some tabs up and above and around. And then along the frame, I also figure out where the fuel filter is going to be. And when I come up here through the cross member, you can see I drill a couple holes there and then another clamp in front of that and then up around the bell housing and make sure you know where it's going to clear the exhaust. I set the tank back on my table and I leave myself plenty of room on the line so that if I ever have to drop the tank, I don't have to worry about yanking lines until the tank is dropped down. Once I've got the uh, lines trimmed, clamp them up and I'll push the tank up and install it. Plug my wires in on a temporary basis for now. Since I'm using the original tank and I'm able to use the original filler, I decided I needed a way to make it locking. Uh, I came up with just some strap iron and built these little brackets. Uh, you can flip it up, take the cap off, put it back on. You can either spot weld the ends of the threads or what I did is just use them like a rivet. I hammered the threads a little bit so that you would really have to work to take this off. But my worry is as some jerk comes walking by and throws a handful of dirt or uh, sugar or something in your tank, this way it keeps the honest honest. I even found a camo paddle lock. Fuel system done. Throw a couple gallons in and... Well, that was anticlimactic. Um, remember, when I do these, I always take a picture of the computer. That way I have a service number when I need to call for technical assistance. Now, no spark. First thing I did is check all of my work, make sure I didn't miss something, because, well, I do that. You know, it's the typical squirrel and walk away and forget what you're doing. However, in this case, I did not forget any of that stuff. I, all my wires were where they were supposed to be and power is where they were supposed to be. And I uh, double checked stuff and then I figured before I get too involved, I'm gonna call Howell Technical in case there's something I'm missing that he knows about from the other thousand people that have called them with this type of an issue. Uh, he went over with all kinds of pin tests and ohm readings and volt readings and stuff with me for about an hour. I really got to give kudos to Howell for their technical guy, A, spending the time and B, knowing what he's talking about. So that was really nice. Um, another good point about going with reputable companies when you're, when you're doing standalone harnesses, uh, the customer service means a lot. So after a day messing with this and on the phone with him a couple times he thought we might have a bad computer which is pretty rare because I don't think I've ever seen one of these computers actually go bad um, so he just said send that one back to me I'll send you another one he said I'm not gonna try to reflash that one in case there's something really screwed up in it we don't want to just you know do the same thing over and over so he sent the new computer out put it in Kind of at my same suspicion, no change in what happens. It doesn't run. <laughs> Not good. Um, I will remind you, don't get frustrated and, and uh, stuff. Just keep looking over what you're doing. Take a break from it. Eventually, you'll find it. And I did. Um, it's notorious. The crank sensors will go out in these, and that's what I thought was happening, except I pulled the crank sensor out, plugged it back in, ran a screwdriver across the top of it, and I got spark and fuel. Well, before I get the what the heck are you talking about comment on waving a screwdriver in front of the crank sensor, I thought I'd do this little sidebar here. Uh, back when I was working on the line as a mechanic, uh, I diagnose ignition systems on HEIs, X3, X4, blah, blah, blah. And when I was doing tests for no spark, one of the little quick tests I would do is I'd pull the distributor cap off and I would take a screwdriver and, and say this is the magnetic pickup inside it, I would just wave the screwdriver in front of the pickup and you could kind of feel the magnetism on it against the screwdriver. And you could also use feeler gauges or a bolt or a screw, anything that's magnetic, anything that would create a pulse on that magnetic pickup 
would then send a signal to the module and the module would drop the, the field in the coil and you would get spark. It was kind of a quick test method to kind of see what's working and what's not. Um, if nothing happened, then you had to go into the real diagnostics. But if you could do that and you were getting spark, then you could move on to a, another point of reference. It was just a real quick test. Well, fast forward 20 something years later, I figured out you could do the same thing on the crank positioning sensor on these LSs. Something's not working like no spark, no fuel. You could pull that sensor out and wave across it and see if anything happens. In this case, I waved the screwdriver the magnetic pulse triggered the uh, fuel system and the ignition coils to, to fire. So it can kind of hone you in on what the problem might be. So that's what I'm doing when I say wave a screwdriver across the sensor. So I'm thinking, oh crap, I've got that reluctor wheel on the uh, crankshaft that's gone bad. Not a good day. Um, these eight ones are also notorious for the tip of the um, crank sensor breaking off on the early engines, and this is an early one, but this sensor's already been replaced, so I thought, well, maybe there was a piece of the old sensor down in there, and et cetera. Not the case. So after several times plugging it in, in the vehicle and it not working, taking it out of the vehicle, running a screwdriver across it and it working, I figured something is wrong in that crank sensor. So I ordered another crank sensor and before it came in, I'm in here screwing around with stuff and I figured something out. When I plug the pin in, when I plug the connector in, the pins, what if they're worn or what if they were bent at some point? They look straight, but when I put it in and then release it, it squishes the little rubber thing down and then it releases it up enough until it catches the lock on that connector. So just for grins, I pulled this off, plugged it in, and I got spark. That told me something is wrong in one, one side or the other. What did I do to fix it? I disconnected it and I bent those three little prongs just a hair. You know, they were like this and I just, just tweaked them enough to where I knew when I slid the connector over it, they would rub real hard contact with, you know, the opposing connector. Plug it in, fired it up. Good to go. Uh, I do have a spare crank sensor now in the glove box that I don't need. Uh, I also have oh, about 12 hours figuring this out, but I just wanted to tell this story because a little perseverance and a little bit of headache, you'll figure it out. Um, you may be three quarters insane by that time, but you'll figure it out. So there's the story of the no start. <laughs> Second computer flashed and ready to go in. Just a side note, I did call Howell up and let them know what I found was the actual problem with it not starting so they can now put that computer I sent back in into service. It is not a junk computer. Round two. Starts, runs, sounds good. Happy day. Well, that right there is why most people don't like electrical. Uh, but, you know, we got her going. So, in my opinion now, all of the real big stuff is done on this truck. You know, we got an engine that runs, a transmission that's in it, rear ends that are in it, and, you know, still got a lot of buttoning up to do, drive lines, more electrical, stuff like that. But you, I'm sure noticed there's been a radiator in this truck for the last couple videos. I didn't want to get off on too many tangents for the video purposes. Next time, or the next video on the Army truck, I definitely want to spend some time and show you how I got a cooling system in this that I think will be very, very functional. Um, and I got a lot of other stuff to do on it too, so. Anyway, please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, it's time for a little bit of R&R &R for me, which means 
off to the dirt, go play, play in the big Jeeps. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. The last of the groups arrived with the Black Widow. Gotta, gotta get some video, you know. Oh, Black Widow's once you go down.
It's a nice line, really. I got this spot. Now. Oh, that's messed up. If you enlarge this, you can see a couple of big horn sheep there. <laughs> <laughs> 